Hi, my name is Ty Nguyen. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, chronic pain and some treatments to actually deal with chronic pain. So you can have like conservative therapies or surgical therapies like spinal cord stimulation, which is what, I'd be, which I'll be focusing on. So as a general outline of what I'm, gonna, what I'm going to be talking about, first I'll delve into some chronic pain background. Uh, I'll go into the mechanism of pain. I'll go into how uh, pain is assessed. Um, some treatments, so like the, the conservative therapies or the surgical methods like the spinal cord stimulation therapies. Um, then we'll delve into two technologies for spinal cord stimulation and then future treatments. So um, where do I see spinal cord therapies or stimulations going? As some general background for some statistics, um, there's about 50 million people that are affected by chronic pain in the United States. Um, there's is 20, about 20 million people impacted by high impact chronic pain, meaning that a lot of their daily activities are hindered by this chronic pain that they have. Um, generally, um, the largest group that's affected by this is about 45 to 64 years old. Um, so common injuries or common causes could be just like injuries, uh, infections, or diseases. Um, so these are just three of the, the biggest reasons why people have chronic pain. Now if we look at this picture, we have the peripheral nervous system right here, and the central nervous system right here, which consists of the spinal cord and the brain. Um, all I want to get from this slide is that um, these two things play a big role in how pain is assessed and how pain is interpreted in the body. So let's say that uh, the per peripheral nervous system has a lot of nerves and, and ganglia all scattered throughout the entire body, and what happens is that you feel pain, it gets sent to the spinal cord, which is the central nervous system, and the spinal cord um, sends signals up to the brain for interpretation. So that's how um, pain is sent. We're going to delve a little bit deeper into that. So uh, there are four steps of pain. Uh, first is transduction, then there's transmission, perception, and modulation. So let's say that you prick your finger. How does that signal get from your finger to your brain and for interpretation. So like I said before, the first step is transduction. Um, what it basically is is that your nociceptors or your pain receptors at the areas or site of injury or pain um, senses the pain. It could either be like mechanical stimuli, thermal, thermal stimuli, um, or chemical stimuli. And what it does is it sends it to the spinal cord. Next is transmission. So then um, that nociceptor signal gets sent to your spinal cord and then that signal travels up your spinal cord to your brain, um, specifically in the um, thalamus or the brain stem region. Next you have the perception of pain, so then from your uh, thalamus or the brain stem, it gets, that signal gets sent to your sensory cortex uh, for interpretation. Lastly you have modulation, so uh, you can have a lot of things that kind of play a role in how your pain is modulated. Uh, mainly you have neurotransmitters that can be released or inhibited that um, help, a, help play a role in how it's modulated. So you can have like serotonin gets released more, uh, dopamine or norepinephrine can also play roles in that too. So now how is the cause of pain assessed? So pain is very, very difficult to, um, I guess, quantify, I guess, just because pain is different for everyone. Um, and all, a lot of things that doctors do is they can have like a scale, so like a one to 10 scale, how bad is this pain? Um, but you can also have other tests that kind of help try to identify where that pain is coming from. So for example, you can have x-rays, which is very good at um, determining if you have like fractures. You can have magnetic resonance imaging, uh, which can identify maybe like infections or tumors within the brain, like these white spots right here. Um, you could also have EMG, which would measure the electrical activity of your muscles. Uh, maybe there's something going wrong with your muscles. Or you could have lab tests, um, where you send out like blood work, uh, and then see if there's an infection or, no, or a disease related to that. Um, so, which brings us to conservative therapies, which is the first you have conservative therapies and then surgical methods. Um, these are ways to kind of treat pain, or treat chronic pain. 
First is physical therapy. You could have um, therapy on how to like um, either cope with that pain or ways in which to like try to eventually reduce that pain that you feel. You could have heat or ice therapy that can have like targeted um, effects on say like you, your forearm hurts, you put a heat or ice on there and it helps reduce the, the pain intensity. You also have stress management. Stress management stress has been shown to increase the um, like how bad pain is. So then if people go through stress management training, they can help to reduce that pain that they feel. Uh, you can also take medications that would probably deal with like all those neurotransmitters that we listed out before, like serotonin, dopamine, or norepinephrine, um, things just to help modulate that pain. So outside of conservative therapies, sometimes conservative therapies don't really always work for every patient. Um, so generally, spinal cord stimulation, which is a surgical method, is only um, after non-surgical methods don't work. Um, just because surgical methods are very invasive, require surgery, require recovery times. Um, but generally, what happens is spinal cord stimulation, or SES, sends mild electrical pulses that kind of change the way pain is interpreted within the brain. Um, and it interrupts those signals uh, felt from the nociceptors throughout the body. There are multiple spinal cord simulators that are um, currently FDA approved and out on the market. Um, you have the Proclaim XR by Abbott, the Senza Omnia by Nevro, the Intellis by Medtronic, and some other ones. Um, uh, but right now we're just going to be focusing on these two just because Spinal cord simulators are kind of have like the same mechanisms, I guess. They differ in small little um, key specifications, but mo mostly they're nearing the same. So the first spinal cord simulator that we're going to talk about is the Proclaim XR by Abbott. Um, some features are burst DR stimulation. Um, it's long lasting. It's compatible with MRI, which is a big thing, just because. Um, if it's compatible, compatible with MRI, that means you don't have to take out the spinal cord simulator in order to get an MRI. Um, another big one is that it's also compatible with an app on your iPhone, um, which makes it very convenient. So everyone has phones. Um, so then what can happen is that you feel pain. Um, you just pull up the app on your phone really quick and change how the intensity of the burst DR stimulation, um, and you can treat it right then and there. So if we take a closer look, um, this device is surgically implanted. Um, it's connected to spinal nerves via leads, so you have like the, the spinal cord simulator um, implanted near like your sacral region. Um, it has leads that are connected to the thoracic seven to ten on your spinal cord, and what it does is it generates pulses, maybe about like usually forty to fifty hertz, um, but it can go up to five hundred hertz on command to alter the pain transmission to the brain. So, like if we remember before the pain mechanism, you have the transduction transmission, perception, and modulation. Um, what this spinal cord simulator does is that it interrupts those pain transmission to the brain, um, kind of uh, masking that pain with a different signal that uh, would normally result in like a tingling feeling. So in a study, there are actually multiple studies that use burst CR simulation or Proclaim XR. Um, and what they found is that it decreased pain intensity. So essentially what they did was they took um, a baseline numerical rating scale, which would just address pain. And they took it after, and they found that overall it decreased pain intensity. Um, and about 80% of the patients preferred burst CR simulation over just regular tonic simulation. Um, and you had also minimal adverse events. You had adverse events would just be defined by serious injury, infection, maybe like leads coming off, um, etc. So ultimately, what they found is that it's safe and effective. The next spinal cord simulator that we're going to talk about is the Senza Omnia by Nevro. Um, so there are some similar features to the other spinal cord simulator. For example, it's MR compatible, it also charges very, very quickly. Um, but one of the main features of this spinal cord simulator is that it has a very, very large range. In fact, it's about two to 10,000 hertz for the, the pulses that you can send to, that, to your spinal cord. Um, it's also upgradable via program. It has some preset programs which make it very, very convenient for patients to use. So we look at um, a little bit closer, it's also very similar to the past 
uh, spinal cord stimulator in the sense that it's implanted so that it's connected to your thoracic 8 to your thoracic 11 region. Um, and what it does is it can stimulate uh, two different things depending on the frequency that you send to it. It can stimulate the dorsal horn, uh, which would have high frequencies like the top line shown here. Uh, you could also stimulate the dorsal column, which would probably be for more lower frequencies, which would be the middle column here. And then you could also have both simulations, so uh, just a combination of both high frequencies and low frequencies. More specifically for this, more specifically for the specification, you have 16 contacts on the dorsal horn. Um, you have pulse rates less than 10,000 hertz. Um, and then in a study that used this actual this spinal cord stimulator, they found that um, there's about 88% reduced pain in 24 of their patients um, and was able to reduce pain in legs, back, arms, um, et cetera, in the long term, which is actually um, very, very good. Uh, similar, similar to the past studies, uh, had minimal adverse events, so then there wasn't really much infection, injury from the implantation, um, the loss of effect of the spinal cord stimulator, to mean that the leads were still connected, um, but they're not, I guess, they're not perfect. So ultimately, spinal cord stimulation, um, as we said before, is only used after non-surgical methods don't work. Um, and what happens is that spinal cord simulators, they do work, as we, as we saw from Pro Proclaim XR and the Senza Omnia. Um, so it does show a great promise to reduce pain, it's just um, you do have to surgically implant it. Um, you have minimal adverse event, events or effects, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, those effects are completely negated. There are still times when, in which the spinal cord simulator leads get disconnected from the spinal cord. Um, so in the future, I think spinal cord simulators can ultimately create more reliable connections and have more durable leads that last a very, very long time. Some of these spinal cord simulators need to replace or recharge every 10 years. Um, so maybe like a way to um, increase the lifespan of the spinal cord stimulator. Um, you can reduce the discomfort of implantation, um, and ultimately, you can also find ways to reduce infection caused by implantation. Um, just because you're inserting this device into the body, there might be an immune response. Um, so other companies can figure out how to reduce that immune response. These are my references. Thank you.